Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water and the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself for no one who ever hated his own flesh but instead nourishes and cherishes it just as christ does unto the church because we are members of his body therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Probably the most important decision in anyone's life after right standing with God and eternal life is who they will marry. Now before we study Paul's portraits, because what we have here are portraits. And before we look at them, might I say something about marriage, because it is so important in that it relates to Christ and His bride. And how never before in the history of humankind has this come under such attack as in our day. A little few points I want to make. Probably from about 1929 was a significant change in thinking because of philosophy and various educational thoughts from professors at universities. The, those ideologies came more pronounced preceding the 60s and the sexual revolution of the 60s. And what occurred in the 60s was a severing of sex from marriage and it became more acceptable outside of marriage that was stage one in my calculation what followed soon after was easy access of the pill and so a medicinal severing with marriage occurred a, a severing of reproduction from marriage was severed soon after that and I won't even go into the abortion side of things. We know how evil that is. Soon after that, we found, found, find another destructive force taking away permanence and sanctity of union. And in many nations, they call it the no-fault divorce um, position. It's where people could claim irreconcilable differences as grounds for divorce and so we had a legal severing of marriage <coughs> that wasn't bad enough most western nations redefined marital laws and family laws thereby changing social expectations and professional expectations and it produced a common legal severing of marriage. In including in all of that was um, the women's liberation movement and the acceptance of um, legal abortion. But finally, up until this current day, we have another major move against marriage. It's 
the removing of gender from marriage. I'm not even referring to same-sex marriages or non-binary gender marriages. I'm going beyond that to what is called genderless and omni-gender unions possessing several or all genders in a union. And so finally we have the severing of gender in marriage. And there's been this consistent severing from marriage starting with the sexual revolution until today with the severing of gender in marriage. I don't know if there's more to come. But up until this day, that's enough for me. And ultimately, what has happened in our post-Christian modern society, the sustained and never unchanging or the sustained and constant attack has devastated families, in Canada right now, there is a father sitting in jail. Why? Because he stood against the law of the land, which proclaimed he had no right, no right as a father, to in any way infringe upon the rights of his 14-year-old to undergo therapy to change her gender. No rights, all taken from him. It attacks the family. It attacks the marriage. And it attacks the church. As someone said, this attack on marriage and family has disenfranchised the nations who are now rushing headlong down the road of anti-marriage and anti-Christ. I want to take those two thoughts as we approach this passage. Anti-marriage and anti-Christ. The text written by the Apostle Paul is intriguing. And tightly woven together here are two portraits. On the one hand we observe the ideal portrait of the earthly married couple. We observe instructions regarding how the husband and the wife are to relate to one another in marriage. And on the other hand, we observe the portrait of heaven, of Jesus and the church. And the two portraits are illustrations of each other. The portrait of the relationship between Christ and the church is God's model of how husbands and wives behave in earthly marriage or to relate to one another. At the same time, the portrait of the earthly marriage depicts what Paul calls a profound mystery of something still to come. So I want to take a look this morning at these two portraits. Firstly, the portrait of the earthly marriage. The strokes with which Paul paints this earthly marriage are directives to give us, both husbands and wives, an understanding of what God sees and desires. And he first addresses wives, and then he moves on to husbands. The first word he gives is wives submit. What? In this modern day? Well, Paul is speaking of respectful submission. If you look at the first words, words, wives submit, and you look right at the end of the passage, you will see, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, we know how respect doesn't come out of nothing. It is earned and deserved. And so we need to understand what Paul is saying. He's linking in the beginning submission and the end Respect And these two are what some people call Pauline um, submission. In other words, it includes absolutely respect. I would call it respectful submission that Paul is talking about. 
There at the end of the chapter in verse 33 is that final crunch. And I think Paul leaves it to the end so that we can read through this and suddenly end with husbands re have to be respected, but not out of a vacuum, out of the fact that they've earned that respect. Here in verse 22, the model of how she submits to her husband also has a qualifying point. As you submit to the Lord. She submits to her husband only in as she and he submit to the Lord. It says she particularly, but we'll see it also implies the husband. One of the things, a study that I, did, I read on in, in college had an interesting take and the author said why does God ask wives to submit and men to love and his point was this because wives don't easily submit and men don't easily love so what he's saying is God is saying because of this struggle within the marriage he says wives submit but because of a failure of men to love, he says, men, love your wives. It doesn't imply that there is no mutual submission at any point or no mutual love at any point. And so I think that's a valid statement to make. It is because of the tendency or the nature of women and the nature of men to fail in these two areas. And I think that was a pertinent paper I read many years ago. I could not quote who it was. I just remember the principle. And so, you know, once one person said, Oh, what a terrible word, the S word, submit. But there's a picture of submission that is learnt as we submit to Christ. It's, it's very simple. Look at the picture that God brings. This portrait stretches out in other passages and other uh, letters the picture of the home if there is not a godly ordered home Paul says to Timothy how then can there be a godly ordered leadership in the church you want to look at bad leadership in the church you'll find it in the home believe what I tell you if there's bad leadership in the church look to the home and you will see bad leadership in the home or bad relationship in the home we don't want to join the chorus of saying you know what is it saying that Paul is a misogynist or that the Bible is outdated I will not and I hope not to join that chorus and I don't want to be drawn down the road of a low view of Scripture. When we start in one area of having a low view of Scripture and saying this is not relevant to today or this doesn't apply. Or remember in Paul's day they were all chauvinists. Hmm, were they? The, G G uh, the Greeks in fact worshipped Diana. Was she a male? No. It's a fallacy to consider the whole concept of a male uh, or patriarchal society as so simplified. It was far more involved with that. Women held high position even in those days. Lydia is a good example of one who was wealthy and had influence in her life. Someone once said, since biblical days we have gone backwards, not forwards. So it's a misappropriation to just say the Bible was written in a day of patriarchalism. The thing is this. God's blueprint of marriage involves one who leads and one who helps. It's like going dancing. Imagine if both try to lead you get sore feet one leads one follows and that's an important principle and that principle 
goes from family through to the church. Someone must lead. It's not a portrait of oppression and domination. It's not a portrait of one being uh, lording over another at all. I think it's like a building. What you see here is this big building. But let me tell you, this building submits to its foundation. It doesn't exist without a foundation. The first storm that comes this way, the building falls. I was watching a little video clip last night of a, a tsunami in Japan at about seven years ago. And it had this power of water. You never see massive waves bombard, just this rise of water and this power of the water. And you could see some of the buildings were not well uh, um, secure. They just kind of like disappeared they just got washed away a marriage depends on the foundation and that's very much a woman's role and what you see might look masculine and well you know what I want kind of thing not necessary let's hope not but the only reason it exists is because there's a solid foundation so that, I believe, is Paul's mindset, is that he's rather looking at this kind of marriage, this Pauline respectfulness of a solid foundation, but it's a togetherness. The building is useless without the foundation. The foundation is bare without the building. Within the marriage, the couple does not strive against one another and, and isn't that what has happened in marriages today there's a striving one against the other instead of a, a, a striving against the world it's not me against you it's us against the world it's us against whatever is out there it's not him against her but a mutual striving for unity unto God a mutual striving in unity to declare the greatness of of the marriage that is to come. Husbands must be a picture of Christ's sacrifice to the church. Throughout my life I've heard it from time to time. I'm going to use terminology you'll understand. Where I've heard a husband who should take the front standing position in a discussion or argument. Instead he throws his wife under the bus. Well, it's her fault. She wanted it like that. It wasn't my idea. Don't throw her under the bus. Be a man, stand up and say, it was my decision. And I will stand by my wife and I will take the bullet. We need to take the bullet a few more times, men, don't we? It's too easy to throw someone under the bus. And if you do that in your family, you're going to do it in the church. If you do that in your family, you're going to do it in your workplace. And I know not too many of you go back to a workplace uh, on Monday, but you will remember and be reminded of those days where someone threw you under the bus at work. Guarantee you, the guy that threw you under the bus threw his wife under the bus too. It was her idea. It's all her fault. That's not a picture of Christ. Christ is a picture of self-sacrifice. You want to do this, dear? Yeah, I don't like this at all, but I'll do it. I will sacrifice not to be self-centered. It's the opposite of what we see today. Self-centeredness. Selfishness. One writer said, this is what happens with marriage. I love what makes me happy as long as it makes me happy. I treasure what makes me feel good. But when it doesn't go my way, I knock on the door of a lawyer. Too easy. Too simple. Husbands love the submission part. But hate the sacrifice part. 
But let me say this. Picture the building. And the building standing firm on that foundation. A husband will sacrifice when he knows he's got a sure foundation. Do you see how the one works with the other? It is so important. So I encourage you in your own marriages, even now. I know some of you have said, you know, man, 40 years, you can't tell me anything. I probably can't. Maybe you need to tell yourself something. Isn't that the call? So basically, there are just three things I want to highlight on this aspect. Let me ask it as a question. Who is the model for how husbands are supposed to love? Christ is the model, the sacrificial model. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Two, what does love like this do? It gives. Christ gave his life. It gives. In fact, it gives, its, it gives up itself. Think of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, take this cup from me, but not your will, not my will, but your will. Instead, we say, Lord, take this cup from me. It's not my will. Thirdly, for what purpose does it give itself up? It gives it up for the purpose of doing good for the one it loves. Christ died because he loved. Christ died to love the church. The good Jesus does for the church is he saves her, he sets her apart, he washes her, he consecrates her, and he presents her in absolute beauty without spot or wrinkle. He nourishes and cherishes her. He becomes one with her. Paul is talking about a love that is not interested in itself. It's interested in giving of itself. The chief interest is doing good for one another. You know, when two people sit down for marriage, I think the questions asked are wrong. Tom, do you love Sally? Sally, do you love Tom? Oh, yeah. Here's the question. Tom, are you willing to give of yourself for Sally? And Sally, are you willing to receive in submission what is given? I think that's the starting point. I find it interesting. Do you know that in India, currently, arranged marriages have a higher success than marriages out of love? Isn't that a scary thought? Arranged marriages are highly successful because there are incredible principles taught to the people beforehand. In Africa, we have a lovely thing. It's called labola. What it means is when a husband wants to marry, he must be sure he's got about 10 or 15 cows. And he gives it to the father of the woman he's about to marry. He starts off his life with giving before he's even started. You know, here our parents pay for the marriages and the weddings rather and all this. No, 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 he must. It's led to some bad situations in South Africa because some men can't afford to get married. So, well, they choose the other options which aren't good. Paul is talking about a love that is not interested in self but interested in in doing good to another and giving unto another. This is really opposite to what we see in the world today. As soon as the giving stops, selfishness sets in. When selfishness sets in, so do the problems. The portrait of marriage 
is a painting before the world of the portrait of Christ. Let me say that again. The portrait of marriage is a portrait before the world of the portrait of Christ and his church. That's why I believe the attack on marriage is so significant because it plays such a significant part of the church, of Christ's work in this world. If marriage fails, it's almost a, a, a slap in the face of God to say, that's the concept you have. Let's see how it will play out in the future. And what does that play out? As easy as it is, and all the attacks on marriage, as easy as it is to get a divorce, so easy it is to divorce oneself from Christ. I have no doubt that the increase of the number of denominations and churches often lies at the heart of this very problem. Commitment to Christ as commitment in marriage. Jesus said that you should die for the church. You should be willing to give your life for the church. I must be honest. How many would really and truly sacrifice to that degree of their life for the church? History teaches us it does happen. So I want to move on to the portrait of the heavenly marriage. Picking up from verse 32. Paul calls that marriage a mystery. Union with Christ, brothers and sisters, is a mystery. It's a mystery that has caused many writers to go down deep mystical roads or otherwise go down roads of error to understand this union. We have union with Christ. Like just as a marriage, God says back in Genesis that the two are made one. That the flesh is in a mystical way united in, together in marriage. So in Christ, we are betrothed to Christ. We are married to Christ. We have union with Christ in the most profound and mystical way. And this mystery is based on what Christ has done sacrificially for the church. Christ was born to this. He was born for this to sacrifice himself so that the bride might be presented one day. One writer puts it like this. He says, forget everything that happened in between. Start here. Jesus died for the bride. Jesus died for the bride. Point three, Jesus died for the bride. He says that is the whole thing that should attract us and captivate our minds. That Jesus Christ died for his bride. Yes, he's resurrected and he'll wait for her when she returns to him. But he died for a bride. He died for one who would be dressed in white without spot or blemish coming unto him. Raised up into eternity. That's why he says Jesus shall save his people from their sins. Marriage must have in the earthly sense a consecrating effect. Sometimes people get into marriage and say, man, that wife of mine or that husband of mine is just impossible. God made them impossible for you to change you. And that wife or that husband is pecking away, slicing off all the dross of your life. Get with the program. Jesus died to save his people from sins. Marriage. Let me say this very cautiously. Marriage does not save. But it's built around the salvation of Christ. And the consecration of each individual. If there was no marriage. Can you imagine the wild world we would live in? Marriage brings sanctity to people. 
There's a wonderful aspect of building a home, building a family, and building a nation. That's been at the heart of God's program in the world, is building marriages, to build families, to build nations, and building the church. Heavenly marriage is not only a mystery of this wonderful union. What does Paul say in verse 25? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to set her apart from sin and present her as a beautiful bride to himself. Do you realize what marriage does? It sets people apart. It sets them apart. It sets them apart from the world. They no longer should Maybe that's a weak word, but they shouldn't partake of the world any longer. They should be set apart. They are consecrated. They are made for that marriage. And that's what Christ is doing until such time as he comes again. Someone said it was through his death that she has been beautified. What a wonderful thought. Through his death, the bride has been beautified. It is through his selfless sacrifice that her sins, which were as scarlet red, have now become as white as snow. It is through his work on the cross that her wrinkles and spots and blemishes and sins have been removed. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him she might become the righteousness of God. Heavenly marriage is also eternal. Maybe you have your Bibles with you and you want to turn to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Consider Revelation 19. I'll just read a few verses from the beginning. But I want you to picture heaven as a buzz with anticipation heaven is excited about the bride coming together with a groom all the angelic beings the seraphim and the cherubim and all the creatures that god has made for heaven are there waiting standing in attendance for this great union in final eternity One writer said this, Moreover, it is also in raptures because of the wedding that is about to take place. Listen to Revelation. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty One, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. What a picture. Every bride, I'm sure, before she gets married, secretly reads this and says, I want a grand dress. I want to look gorgeous. I want to look... As though I'm some, someone special beyond anyone else. And rightly so. And then flip over to chapters 21. And we get another glimpse of the bride. Then came one of the seven angels. And spoke to me saying. Come. I will show you the bride. The wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God having a glory of God like a most rare jewel like jasper like as unto crystal the bride of the lamb is a city of God coming unto God coming out of heaven as it were she is now being made ready for the new heavens and the new earth in eternal honeymoon with the groom. What a wonderful picture scripture paints for us. Let me draw some pertinent points this morning. 
as much as man needs marriage. And I mean man as woman and man. To find that union and communion. So man needs a relationship with Jesus Christ. God is holy. He's pure and he's righteous. But our lives are stained. Our hearts are filled with rebellion. All we have to do is to look to the law of God. It shows us it requires a true worship of God alone. It forbids any false views of God. It forbids any kind of worship of other gods. It forbids lying, hate, stealing, adultery, and every other desire that belongs to man. Study of God's commandments will carefully show you that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And those sins and those stains, we have garments that are as filthy rags. But God, in His union with us, first, He doesn't want to touch us until we are made pure, until we are dressed in His pure and righteous garments, made ready for the wedding day. Instead of stained garments, they are pure and white. Brothers and sisters, we have family who are struggling in their marriages. Christians struggling in their marriages. Most of them are younger than us and we've been there. We've been through the trials. But have we ever applied it in this way? Jesus tells us about earthly marriage and heavenly marriage in one simple verse. If anyone wishes to come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Marriage is filled with self-denial. The walk to Christ is filled with self-denial. Take up your cross. There's one scar as I close. I want to remind you of that is a scar is necessary for marriage and a scar that is necessary for our walk in following Christ. It's not the nails in the hands or the feet. It's not the, the, the sword thrust into the side. It's a scar the Bible doesn't actually state. It's a scar maybe I've made up in my imagination. But I want you to come with me to the Via Della Rosa. And there Christ, upon His right shoulder, is thrust a heavy wooden splintery cross. And that cross is thrust upon him. And he walks down the Via Della Rosa with a cross upon his shoulder. I want you to imagine 200 kilograms maybe dragging behind. Maybe on his shoulder about equivalent to 45 kilograms. And he's dragging this down the Via Della Rosa. And it's bouncing upon the cobbled stones. Down the steps it bounces. Striking his shoulder and injuring an already injured Christ. That's the scar of carrying your cross. And you know what God did? Even to his own son who is about to die for us. I will give you a helper to carry your cross. And Simon was chosen to carry that cross. God has given you, if you're in marriage, someone to help you bear the burden of the cross. And if you're on your own, He's given you the blessed Holy Spirit to help you bear the burden of the cross. None of us should come before God one day without a scarred shoulder. To show, Lord, I've carried my cross. And I've changed, whether in the institution of marriage on this earth, or whether in following Jesus as Lord and Savior. I have been changed. Look at my scar. I've gladly borne the scar of sacrificial love.
Weddings are the culmination in closing of a developing relationship. It develops and sometimes too quick and sometimes too long. Sometimes just at the right time, the ceremony occurs. Just at the right time, Christ will come for his bride. Not a day too soon, not a day too late. We read in Revelation, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Again, we read, come, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. Marriage is important. There's only one thing I want to remind you of greater importance. Is the marriage of the Lamb. Maybe this morning... You're thinking, I heard that, and well, that's, I kind of like the idea, the analogy of marriage. It wasn't too harsh. It wasn't too harsh for the woman. It wasn't too harsh for the men. But if that's all you're thinking about, I want to ask you this morning are you thinking about your union with Christ? Have you got that relationship like a marriage? Where he knows you and you know him. Where he is yours and you sacrifice for him. And he is there with you. Walking with you along the way. Like a helper. A helpmeet all the time. Present with you. If you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. As you would have in a marriage. You're missing the greatest enjoyment of marriage in your life. Union with Christ. I urge you today, go home, get upon your knees and say to the blessed Lord Jesus, come, I'm ready, I'm your betrothed, I seek no other. Let's pray.